Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the new media show. And uh, we're coming here, uh, beautiful, trade windy here in Honolulu this morning, much better from the way it was last week when you could hardly breathe because of the fog. But on the bottom, I got my uh, venerable co host, Rob Greenlee. Good morning, Rob. Good morning. It's great to be here again. Yep. So, uh, Rob, uh, you're using a new mic. I am. Because I noticed the big uh, the big mic is gone and you're on a wireless, so we'll see how that works out. Yeah. Well, actually, no, I'm actually doing a lapel mic here. I don't know if you can see it, oh, and yeah, it's actually yeah. plugging into my um, my mixer, so it's a it's a wired connection. Yeah, oh, still, it's, it's awesome. So uh, it's probably better than this, you know, this big thing in in front of my face. And uh, this morning, we're welcome to have uh, Rob Walsh on. Good morning, Rob. And Rob, uh, I don't, I don't know how we're going to keep this straight. Rob one, Rob two, but uh, <laughs> somehow we're going to. But good morning, Rob. Well, I'll, I'll definitely fall under the Rob two category since Rob one was doing this longer than I have been. I, I feel weird. I'm with. I'm usually not the new guy. I've been doing this since 2004, and I'm the new guy out of the three of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, 2004 for, is pretty early, yeah. Rob. <laughs> for, for those of you that don't know, Rob, uh, I guess give us your official title over at Libsyn. What is your official title over there? I am VP of Podcaster Relations for Libsyn. So VP so. of Podcaster Relations. So that's you, you keep the podcasters ha happy, help them out. Uh, just about jack of all trades, I think, is what it ends up being, doesn't it? Yeah, it's a mixture of biz dev and A&R and sales. So it's just a little bit of everything, um, but it's fun. I get to talk to podcasters. That's my job. I get paid to talk to podcasters. So and yeah, that's, that's, uh, I'm living the dream. That's always cool. So uh, Same with me. I'm the same <laughs> way. I get paid to talk to podcasters too. <laughs> you know, and, and just jokingly though, sometimes uh, getting paid to talk to podcasters, boy, I tell you, they can be a handful sometimes, especially the new ones. But um, it, it yeah. is one of those things that uh, you love to see the new ones come in and, and start. But at the same time, you know that it's going to be a bevy of questions and maybe some support issues. And so uh, until they get a few. And then it's like after like one or two episodes, they're like, I don't need you anymore. I'll just let me do my own thing. There's. My favorite questions are the ones are when they uh, they come in they go, okay, I got my show up, it's launched, I'm ready to go, and I want it, I'm ready for advertising, and I go and look at their stats and they've had twelve <laughs> downloads, <laughs> over five episodes. I'm like, okay, let's work on promotion first, then we'll work on the monetization. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> and, and we'll probably talk a little bit about some of those those fun stories uh, here in a little bit. But I do want to mention today that uh, we're lucky to have on board, and this is a some folks that we've been working with here for a little while uh, on Geek News Central as well, my regular tech show, is we've got the folks from Multimedia Communications on board as the sponsor of today's show. And, uh, you know, we're streaming up on live stream right now. So those of you that are watching the live stream, you're seeing the uh, pro version of the account. And uh, the only really difference between the pro and I don't know what the other version is, 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 is a, a delta in amount of money that you pay them. But uh, we got gear available from live stream at uh, mmcom.com forward slash live stream. The team over there will give you a good uh, a good deal, and they can get you set up with lights, cameras, you know, just about everything you need. They'll source the stuff that you want and uh, work very hard to get you a price that will beat most online prices that you're going to find if you're just shopping at uh, a variety of different other online destinations. But definitely check out Multimedia communications mmcom.com and uh, don't forget to mention when you're over there uh, tpn that'll get you uh some additional hey welcome to the you know well glad to talk to you because i know that you're a content creator uh sent to them by by us so we want to thank multimedia for being on board here today for the show so now that we got the speaking of the advertising portion of the business out of the way <laughs> Rob, how's things been going? What's new? Uh, what's new with you guys? And I guess you know, I, I don't know, Rob, if, uh, Rob number one, Rob <laughs> Greenly. I, I don't know if that's exactly where we wanted to start, but uh, why don't you give us a rundown where you guys are at, Rob? Well, um, I guess the biggest thing that's new with us, uh, you know, is we've been making the smartphone apps for people for a while, and 
and now we've started to make them available where they can be free to the end users. And, and we've seen a lot of uptake, I guess, on the smartphone side, on the mobile side. Last month, uh, we had 53.1% of our, our downloads were directly to mobile devices, and that's the highest it's ever been. And it keeps going up. Uh, computer direct downloads directly were 46.82%. So I think, I think the biggest thing what we're seeing in, in new and trends is that we've passed over that 50-50 mark um, for direct downloads to mobile devices and really seeing mobile now taking over. You know, I think what, um, what we're seeing on our side is that while people are using smartphones, we don't see them using the apps. I don't know if it's just a difference in space or, or what people are using, but, you know, I think we're right at about, on our side of the fence, I think we're 38, 39, maybe 40 percent um, – you know, using smartphones, but a very, very small percentage that are actually using a AKA dedicated app. I, I don't know if that's a indication that they're using the tablet to go straight to people's websites and, and access data, if they're using the podcast app and in, uh, in iTunes and because, you know, they're still pretty much king of the hill when it comes to, to downloading. And so I guess in a sense, they're using a podcast app from, from Somebody. iTunes, but, uh, yeah, and I think we're yes. probably on this this topic, we should probably get really clear on what what we're defining as a as a podcast app versus otherwise, right? Right. I mean, I mean are we talking about a standalone app, or are we talking about one that's uh, um, that's you know like an aggregator app? And I think, or there are probably some apps that are somewhat in between those worlds too. So, what we what we saw last month was uh, 7.5% of our downloads were directly to what we call standalone, the personal app of a producer. Um, mm -hmm. 7.1% of the mobile downloads were what we would call aggregator apps. So those would be, uh, and that includes Stitcher, because we have Stitcher pulling directly from some of our shows. Uh, so we mm -hmm. have some of our bigger shows where they, uh, Stitcher pulls right from us. So actually, Stitcher was, of all the aggregators, Stitcher was our biggest hit. Um, then Pocket Cast came in after that. But 73%, roughly, I think it was, um, let me see, 71.3% uh, was I, um, Apple Core Media, which includes Safari and, uh, and, and the podcast app. So you, unfortunately, uh, we don't have that broken out. But yeah, 71.3% is, is to uh, iOS stuff, just Apple Core Media. On, on all the mobile downloads. Yeah, it's it's curious because you know we see and it's it's a, it's interesting how there's a little bit of a spread here because we're seeing Downcast on the Android side being the number one app behind AKA the iTunes podcast or I guess the podcast app within iTunes and then everything else is like below that. Uh, Stitcher, you know, comes in there and, and gets a percentage, but we really don't see. I mean, to us, it's negligible. To us, it's uh, you know, it maybe a, a percent, a percent and a half on um, people using apps. So it's kind of weird. Now on the other side, we see about three percent on smart TVs, no TT stuff. But we're also kind of focused on that. So maybe the delta is is, you know, we're focused on the on the OTT side and and the mobile yeah. applications are secondary for us. Yeah, on, on the set top boxes, we get 006 percent, yeah, 0.05, 0 0.06 0 in any given month, and it's been steady like that for couple of years it really hasn't broken above that number for us hmm. so guys on that topic on the the over the top question uh it, it appears that there's not a lot of usage there right now but the question that i have for both of you guys and kind of in a bigger picture is, is that um I'm, you know as you look at both of your guys's hosting platforms what's the percentage that that each one of you guys have that it is actually hosting video i'm just curious because that's what's being played on these set-top boxes. It's probably not going to be right. audio. Yeah. You know, we don't have a lot of video. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the percentage of us on the video is definitely under 20% and probably lower than that, uh, probably maybe even down to under 10%. But we do have the biggest podcast in the world, Happy Tree Friends, which is video. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they're just not, they're not getting any traction uh, anywhere on mm -hmm. set-top boxes. Do they have a channel well, or are they... Uh... Do they well, have a presence on the set top box? That's the question. Today. They're in the well. I mean, they're in the iTunes. They're in the iTunes directory and the iTunes app. The iTunes directory has been in Roku forever, and it's on the Apple TV. Um, yeah. You know, so you know they're on there, and they're one of the popular video ones on on iTunes. I just, I just 
from my experience, I just don't see people consuming podcasts on set top boxes. Definitely not audio ones. And we have really long form audio. So you, know, you have Joe Rogan and Adam Carolla and these guys that are doing two, three hour podcasts. And I just don't see people sitting in front of their television and listening to a, a two or three hour podcast when they can just listen on their smartphone and move around the house. Yeah, I think probably yeah. the delta there on between us is that, you know, we focused on it when it started and people know that they can get their content on the set-top boxes. So that's probably where the delta is with, uh, you know, in just the percentages. It's just purely the accessibility in the space. Now, obviously, Rob, the video stuff is the biggest um, portion of that. And, we made, and when we actually did our breakout recently, we did audio-video combined. So I have to have Angela pull the numbers and see what the – you know, see what the actual data point is from a, a video only. And I and to be honest with you, I don't know exactly what our total video numbers. It probably it probably mirrors pretty close to what Rob's saying. We're probably, you know, eighty, eighty five percent audio, fifteen percent video. And it, you know, it's what okay. it really and boils down to is that video is more expensive. You know, the yeah. guys that are doing video need more storage and they have to buy a bigger bigger media plan. And okay. uh you know, so, the, you know, and also at the same point, it, uh, you know, most of the guys that are doing video are doing it at a, at a professional level and, and don't necessarily qualify for a independent content producer's account. So, you know, they're often fine, uh, you know, hosting on a, on a, you know, they're moving enough bandwidth where they can go to a CDN and, and, and get better pricing uh, from a volume standpoint. So, um, you know, I think that's probably, or the, or the video guys are just putting their stuff up on YouTube or as we talked about. I think, yeah, I just, YouTube one, <laughs> that's why I look at YouTube one well, on video. Yeah. Um, but I say to people, if you are on YouTube and you, you still should have a podcast because YouTube is blocked at a lot of businesses. So you should still put your stuff up on as a podcast, but don't put it up as HD, put it up as 640 by 360. Then at least you only have to do one RSS feed and it covers everything. You know, 640, 360, H.264, M4V. Then you work on Apple TV. You work on all the iOS devices. You work on most of the Android devices. But a lot of people want to do HD, and it's, and that just chews up. I mean, HD is what uh, 60, 70 times bigger than an audio file. Yeah, if you look at this show, um, and if I put up the 640 by 360, and if we do an hour and a half. Uh, that will be about a eh, gig and a half, maybe, will be the size of the of the file. And if I take that to the HD okay. version, eh, it puts it to maybe a little over two, two and a half um, gigs on the size. Maybe. And what I kind of see from a breakdown, it's it's definitely more important to have the smaller than the larger, but you need to have really all three because of the consumption types. You know, you got a certain audience that's coming in and watching on. If they are watching on the set-top box, they want to watch on HD. They don't want to watch you at 640 by 360. And then if they're watching on a desktop or if they're watching on a mobile device, then the 640 by 360 and then even 320 by 180 for the for the mobile guys. So it's, you know, if you're going to do video, you have to have, you know, at least in my opinion, the three different uh, levels out there. If you're going to be on a set-top box, you have to have HD. If you're not on HD, you might as well not even... And put it on because just imagine watching a 640 by 360 video on a on a 60 inch flat screen. It's it's not going to be a good experience. Again, yeah, that's I where see YouTube the, comes the in. Lar larger video podcasters like the 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 Twits and the Revision Threes, they are doing exactly that. Todd, they're they're putting out an SD version and they're putting out a like a large version and they're putting out an HD version and. And that's exactly the reason why they're doing it. Cause, yeah, I talked to these guys, and they they say that, that they want to have a version that will play on the mobile phone and not chew up a huge amount of bandwidth, right? Then they want to have a version that that looks good on a tablet, and they want to have a version that looks great on a um, big screen TV, you know, an HD TV. So the the issue that that currently exists in the podcasting space right right now around this is the fact that. Uh, normally, those are put into aggregator catalogs as three separate feeds that are kind of duplicative, right? So when you look at the the artwork, it looks like that there's just three duplicates in there, and the only place now some podcasters are are, are doing it right, and and others are not. Uh, the the right thing is to do is to tag each of the artwork for each of those feeds as either SD, large, or or Mobile. HD. 
Um, but a lot of podcasters that are doing this, um, even even the biggest guys in the space, do not label their artwork. Um, and I think it's uh, um, as we look into the future, if podcasting, if video podcasting is going to find its own, I think some more you know principles on how to do this need to c come into place. And also, you know, a a listener or a viewer goes to a a aggregator page that basically has that series and and it lists the three different options as part of that series. It isn't three separate um, podcasts in the catalog. Right. So I mean, I, so I think that one of the reasons that the video podcasting stuff hasn't really taken off and and done well is because it's it's just been a broken experience in most situations for 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 audience. I I would say. There's nothing wrong with the strategy of just putting out one video feed that has a, a decent quality. It's not a necessarily a full HD, but somewhere in between. It's that large, uh, and, and that's what I typically do, do do with the the Zoom kind of features. Is that I'll feature the large version, but I won't feature the large and I won't feature the small unless the feature only appears on a mobile phone. Now. So when I say feature, I mean promoting, right? So that kind of gives you a little bit of glimpse. I'm trying to kind of balance both worlds, right? The the tablet as well as the phone, in what I promote on on the platform. But but I still believe that we need to create one page for a show, right? That offers audio and these different versions that can be played on different devices. And I, and it's it's, I'm not sure how we get there, but. Anyway, that's just my thoughts on that. Yeah, well, it's largely up to the up to the platform guys, you know, because that's you yeah. know that's what it boils down to. It's not an issue for the for the content creators because that's where they're putting all their stuff now is on yep. one page anyway. So yeah, you know, ultimately what we tell I tell the producers and it, you know is if you want to keep your costs down and have your best optimization in like iTunes, one RSS feed, not three because you're going to get found better if you're just one feed and because you move up in the rankings by having more people subscribe to that rather than splitting your subscribers over multiple feeds. And take your HD video and throw it up on YouTube. You want HD video, put it on YouTube, but go mm -hmm. with the 64360. If you export to iPod setting and compressor or QuickTime Pro, it works out to 6 meg a minute. So an hour long is only 360 meg when you do that setting. And that keeps their cost down um, while at the yeah. same time allowing them to be better optimized where it runs across all devices and iTunes. Now, yeah, if, if you want to have the HD, put it up on YouTube and let your audience know, hey, you want to see HD, go to YouTube, find it there. Personally, um, Rob, I, I think that's very bad advice. You're doing them a disservice because people wanna don't want to watch 640 by 360 on their Apple TV. They just don't. You look at they the, don't watch it on Apple TV anyway. Uh, they, most people are consuming on mobile. I mean, it, and most not people are consuming on the not computer. For, not for video I mean, podcasters. so most people aren't Chicken consuming. Chicken or the egg thing, right? Yeah, yeah. And I the, mean, most people are not consuming video on, on set top boxes, and we're not seeing it. And most people are getting it on the go. That's what we see. Fifty three percent are on mobile. You know, and even perfect for happy tree friends, nine hundred and fifty thousand downloads. They had sixty three on Roku. They had 500 downloads out of 950,000 on Apple TV. And that's, I, mean, I think they're being unfair there because they don't have a dedicated channel. They're buried somewhere, you know. So, you you know, you talk to you talk to folks at Revision 3 and Twit, and that is, you know, that is going to go contraire to anything that the rest of them are doing. You know, well, let's, Revision let's, 3 has all their stuff up on YouTube. Well, of course, they have it everywhere. Yeah. And like any, everyone yeah. should have stuff everywhere. But to say to only do one video feed to a video content creator, you, you I might... I said if you're trying to keep your cost down, oh, well, that's how you do it. <clears throat> if you're doing yeah. video, there's no keeping the cost down. Yeah, I think, you know, I yeah, think A lot of people really don't have more than gets... $20 a month or $40 a month to spend on this. Then so, they, I mean, they're, they're trying not, to just not do this be, as a hobby. They're not going to be doing video then. Not well. Well, the the thing is, is that I mean, a lot of those big guys like Twit and and uh, Rev Three have put a full court press effort into getting all their content on 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 set top boxes. You know, I know that they're 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 really aggressive. I mean, both these guys are really aggressive right now, and I would say that Rev Three is has led the whole whole space in 
I mean, not just podcasting, but the whole video space, I think Rev3 and Netflix are the two leaders in taking online content to set top box experiences on, on TVs. I think th those guys kind of, kind of pioneered this whole thing. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that the opportunity is there for video on, on the big screen TV um, as podcasts per se. And I think that the, the current experience uh, is the problem right now. It's, it's not something that's front and center I mean, I mean, I'll be frank with you. The best podcast experience that I know on a set-top box is actually a, a TiVo right now. Um, I mean, I'm not saying from a discovery perspective, but how it actually. So once you get subscribed, and it shows up right in your list of of um, uh, DVR recordings uh, from the broadcast side, and it's it's just you know you go look at what's in your your inbox on the TiVo, and you have video podcast sitting right next to TV show, um, regular TV show recordings. I'm not saying that's, that's the future here. I think what we're talking about here is more on, on demand stuff. And, but, but it just seems like that the whole video podcasting space hasn't really gotten the, the best kind of focus to, to create that experience that will actually um, show some growth. And it does get back. I mean, Rob, just like we're saying in, in both of you guys, it, it does get back to, what kind of content it's people i mean a large amount of people are probably not going to watch an hour and a half video podcast on their TVs but a certain percentage of the audience will and i think we both will agree that you know audio is still king you know audi is. audio is what ends up paying the bills but oh yeah you know the uh the advertisers want video and, uh, you know, most of the campaigns we're doing right now, if at least 25% of the shows in a campaign aren't video, they don't want to be on the buy. Um, because you know, it's kind of weird. It's, uh, it's sexy. It's a thing to do. It's where, um, you know, where they can make the biggest impression to their bosses. And it, it sounds kind of odd, but uh, some of the stuff is ego-driven when it comes to ad buys and having... Um, their advertisers out there. So, you know, I think in time, you know, video will continue to grow. You know, my show, my personal show, my tech show, um, you know, you, you wonder, okay, so I do an hour and 15 minutes. I'm here in this studio, no different than uh, I am now, except those two shows are just showing a, a backdrop. And, you know, why do, uh, why didn't, you know, 20, 21% of my audience you know, sit and watch me for an hour and a half. It's a little, to me, or an hour and 15th, to me, it's a little bizarre. But at the same time, um, I understand that some like to listen, some like to watch. So those that like to watch, I, you know, I make the content available for them. Does it decrease my profit margin on the actual uh, amount of money I make on the show? Sure, because it costs more to deliver the video. But I wouldn't have that 15% of the audience if I didn't have the video portion. It works for some people, and it won't work for others. But for the average guy that's doing a show, you know, audio is still obviously pretty much king. Yeah, much more time in the day to consume the audio than the video. Absolutely. Yeah. So does that mean that really what, what we need to do as podcasters is do a much better job in the, the, the production of our videos? If we want to be successful on these other other larger screen experiences, I mean, I, I mean, is that the key? Yeah, do you guys think it's absolutely the key. And you know, you look at the shows that are successful, and they have a high amount of production. And it's it's definitely it's, uh, you know not minutes, but uh, many times probably several hours of editing and graphics and everything else. You know, when I went to CES's last time, my goal was was to find. Uh, you know, a solution that we could bring into the space that would allow chroma key and, you know, and I hate to say it, the ESPN, the, uh, the video shows and the pricing is just still not there. The pricing is still extraordinarily, uh, high. So, you know, we're, we're still a couple of years away from bringing, you know, all the extra graphics that we want into, into the shows. And, you know, it's kind of dumb, but that is, you know, in for, you know, I'm lucky I've got this great uh, system here and I can do the picture in picture and bring the graphics in. But, uh, 
you know, my budget was different than the 99% of the other folks that are out there doing it. I want a solution that uh, a guy running Wirecast or one of those other solutions is able to uh, to implement on his side and, and, you know, really up the game. So I really think that's what the – and hate to – and, all, you know, the content's still king too. So let's not forget that. Guys, I want to also bounce an idea. I, I've been thinking about this for the last year or so uh, around the whole video podcast. So if you think about where where the industry is today and where people are monetizing, uh, you know, around kind of video shows and things, it's it's usually I don't know related to to streaming, Flash or the HLS streaming backends, and. Do you guys think that there there is a potential that we could create a a platform and a, a you know a kind of a, a change in this space to go um, do video podcast kind of distribution methods that actually link to the streams versus um, doing this this download progressive download thing which can can chew up a lot of bandwidth and also make it difficult for, for the audience to get a, a great playback experience. Part of the problem, I think, and I'll let Rob add his two cents here. Part of the problem with that, Rob, is that either way you're delivering, you know, you have to have a complete different infrastructure in place to do a on-demand stream that when you stop, the bandwidth amount stops. Yep. You know, that that's a whole, you know, that that's that's a, that's in, in a very significant infrastructure you're essentially doing what you're putting a netflix infrastructure in place is what you're doing there is yeah i mean you're you're basically doing something similar to what what the youtube folks are doing but but it is possible to go out and get a a, a streaming account at a but, cdn but right? the thing is though on you know if you, if you really look at what's happening on a roku or a samsung smart tv you're not downloading even when you're doing even when you're going to my show now even though it's sitting on a CDN, when you click play on the Roku, it's only taking a piece. It's not downloading. None of those devices download. And even on, even on your tablets, if you are pressing play, um, the majority of them are not downloading. Now, mo the only thing they do bad is they don't remember the marker. They don't remember where they left off, so yep. it makes it harder to go back. But, you know, so the majority of the devices, at least on the mobile side, are not AKA downloading the, and unless you're using an app and you've told it to download, Rob, or, you, well, it depends on the player too. True, yeah. Um, on iOS, yeah. many of the players actually do the progressive downloads. They're starting to buffer them on the iOS devices. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the problem is if you go to, to support the streaming, then you have to give up on the progressive downloading side of or you have to have both infrastructures in place and that's really as Todd was saying increases your cost so you have to have both you can't give up yeah. one but you still have to do the progressive download you want to support podcasting but it is it is almost one in the same the file doesn't have to sit somewhere else the device just tells you how it wants the the media delivered you know and that's one of the reasons why apple now requires you know byte serving you know that's they they do not want well matter of fact you can't even get yep. on iTunes if you're not on a host that does byte serving and I think you know most people that are even on most of the you know if they're hosting on their own and you know, most of those types of situations ho um, support byte serving we may get one support taking a month someone asking they've got an issue Dropbox does not support it so yeah folks, Dropbox don't be podcasting doesn't. on Dropbox yeah, a, lot yeah. of, a lot of people are <laughs> you doing that anyway, I know right? oh, I shake my head I see I see there's tutorials out there recommending it I'm just like really yeah hey, I actually uh, had a talk with the Dropbox folks and yeah. uh, and one of the reasons why they don't support byte serving is they're afraid if they did they would all of a sudden they, they don't want to be a CDN so that's one of the reasons why they don't support byte serving on Dropbox. Yeah. And per their terms of service, they right. really don't want podcasting. Right. Well, and also the whole, uh, it, it feels to me like that whole bite serving thing is is um, kind of like one step closer to what I'm talking about here. I mean, um, you know, on Apple's, you know, I, but it's, you know, I think it's... back and I think about it, you know, like with Blip, I think Blip's a good example here of what's, what the problem is. And inverse of that, what the opportunity is, is that if, Video podcasting is going to be successful. I think it need, it needs to evolve into something else as well. And and I agree with you guys that currently 
it can be expensive to do both and and a lot of in all the players actually all support progressive download but it, it feels like to me that for the business models to start making sense that that it's gonna I think we need to move in that direction I don't know if it's gonna happen you know you know like Rob you said uh, that uh, YouTube is one and and if you look at you know blip and you look at uh, you know these other companies that are kind of kind of taking video podcasts and putting them on streaming platforms. So that's kind of where I'm coming at from this. It just feels like that that uh, because we're not evolving into this streaming world that the video podcasting side is going to kind of get left behind. Um, anyway, that's, you know, that's I, my thought. And I've always thought, you know, the, the real reason why I do live is because it's, you know, number one, it's made me a better content creator. Number yeah. two, there's no editing. You know, you get yeah. done, you're done. Um, and, you know, and it, it's an ends to the means. It's an ends to get a recording. And it gives me a little bit of, of interaction. Um, you know, and I think yeah. certain content will fit certain genres of, of media. And it just, you know, the content creator has to decide, you know, what works best. Um, and, and they really, they're, they're going to decide it. Um, and, 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 and Rob and I, and you, all of us know that, uh, when we're in our vehicles or we're, we're not in the gym or when we're, wherever we are, we have more time to, uh, to listen than we do to yep. watch. Um, yep. so you you know, what is your watching hours per day? And probably in minutes, not in hours. Well, I guess it also it depends on, you know, how far of a commute you have, you know, I mean, a lot of, you know, I, I, I listen to a lot of audio podcasts as I'm working. So I, I still think that there's a lot of place. And I also think that this whole kind of apps in cars is another big, big trend that's, that's definitely coming. And, and clearly I see the, the whole broadcast uh, radio industry really kind of concerned about this right now, uh, about this whole movement to, digitally deliver audio to cars via, you know, Pandora, Stitcher, you know, you just, th there's, there's a race to that. I think Stitcher's done a area. really good job with their partnerships in the audio industry. I think, you know, that'll pay off over the next three to five years. Um, yeah. But right, right now, there are some cars, and I think you can see every year more and more cars are going to have Stitcher there. And, and being on Stitcher is really important as an audio podcaster. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I think too with the cars, you know, what, what doesn't change and where's my phone? What doesn't change is if I'm listening here and I walk out the door, yeah. it, it doesn't matter mm -hmm. what is going on with my, with my car. I don't have to worry about having the content in the dashboard. It's, it's right here. And, you know, the majority uh, of cars yep. being sold today have Bluetooth, you know, yep. so as soon as I get in the car, you know, it basically prompts me, do you want to put this on the Bluetooth on the car? And I say, yes. And, you know, I, I don't even, I don't even stop where I was, where I was listening. And, uh, and to much to the chagrins of my kids, cause my kids are like, <laughs> Oh, him again, or, Oh, do we have to listen to this or, you know, so what do they do? They break out their mobile devices, plug in their earphones, and they listen to what they want to yeah. listen to. So, you know, that's something to think about, too. Whereas oh, before, yeah. a car was captive, and you, were, you, were, you had to listen to what mom or dad wanted to listen to. Now, you got three people living, li listening to three different pieces of content, and that multiplies the opportunity to get in someone's ear, even though it's a teenager. You know, so um, there's huge, huge potential. So, um, you know, I think we beat up stats. I didn't want to necessarily get into a whole stats discussion today. Um, but, 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 you know, it is interesting. That always happens when I get both of you guys together. That's what's so great about getting both of you guys it, together. Is it is interesting. And yeah, it is interesting, though, on how the data is, you know, the data deltas are. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of an interesting uh, topic that we could probably spend a, a whole hour on. But. Let's talk just a little bit about, um, you know, what are you seeing uh, in, in content creators, just the average content creator? Are you guys, Rob, are you guys still seeing the guys that are coming in and 
they have great intentions by show 20 they're done you know what, what are you guys seeing on your side from a you know people be putting content up and 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 sticking with it you know we still see the average podcast um there when they come on and sign up they're staying with us at least a year um when you know when i look at ones that have canceled out that almost all of them are you know, most of the ones that cancel um have been with us a, a year at least a year but yeah when I actually i actually do send an email out to everybody that leaves and I say, you know, thanks for hosting with us. You know, something we could have done to help you. Uh, why'd you leave? And the vast majority of the responses, over 75% of the responses, and I get about a 25% response rate, which is pretty good. About 75% of them, the reason they left, pod fading. Yeah. yeah. Just, you know, they're like, you know, my favorite one, though, I have to say the best response I ever heard was, my my co-host didn't like that I was dating her ex-boyfriend. <laughs> so we had to end the show. <laughs> So I responded back and said, "Hey, you should do a show with her ex-boyfriend." Oh, that's <laughs> that's, right. that's that's good. You know, and, that's and, awesome. And you know what I see too now. I'm and with something I'm starting to see, which is a little bit concerning, is I'm seeing some shows that have been around many years. Um, you know, some of the longtime guys that have been doing it for a while, who uh, have had a certain level of success in a from even an audience standpoint and a monetization standpoint. I'm starting to at some point scale back. So, you know, here we are, and I guess we can expect that. You know, we're whatever we're heading yeah. in nine years of content, mm -hmm. and we see some of these guys that have been uh, doing it four or five years. I think it's just a matter of people decide they want to do something different, they want to yep. try something else, and they don't necessarily end the show because they pod faded, but they've they've you know developed a new interest. I think every show has a life. I mean, MASH is no longer on the air. Lost is no longer on the air. Sadly, Battlestar Galactica is no longer on the air. I think every show has a life. Um, how long that life is just depends. Um, but eventually, every show at some point in time will pod fade or the, the host will die. Um, but some <laughs> things, the show is, <laughs> at some point, die the show from ends. doing the podcast, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think that there's always been a lot of churn in this space. Um, I mean, even the, the the early days. I mean, I'm 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 one of them. You know, I I pod faded. You know, of course, I don't know if you qualify doing doing a broadcast radio show for seven years um, and then quitting pod fading. I'm not quite sure, but um, but I think there is a certain cycle that a a podcaster goes through, and and it's like you know sometimes life gets in the way. You know, and um, there's there's other things in life that can be more important than um, spending your whole time doing a podcast. Um, I mean, I think all three of us are kind of kind of the exception here. We've been able to build kind of careers around podcasting, uh, and and a lot of people haven't been able to actually you know, haven't been lucky enough to actually do that, um, and but would love to. So you know, it's. I've seen a lot of churn, and the churn that I see now isn't any different than it was back in 2005 or 2006. It's, and it's the same with the the the, the audience, the listening audience, um, churns through uh, podcasts pretty fast too. So you know the the subscription and unsubscribes and stuff have always kind of mirrored mirrored each other, uh, as far as in the stats that I've seen in the past and. And people come in and out of shows. They're trying new shows. They they get bored or they move on to something else. Or like you say, they have a different interest. So this is going on on both the listening and the the producing side. And it's it's healthy and it's human nature. You know, I look at uh, at my show, and it's kind of funny because um, you know we for years. I mean, my wife just knows Monday and Thursday night is block. You know that is. Starting about six o'clock, you know, I we finish dinner and I disappear in the cave here for, you know, the next three three and a half hours, and uh, and it's just it's just the way it is. So, you know, lo and behold, um, my wife has decided to uh, leave the job she's at. And she's at home, and at the same time, she she sold her vehicle, which we needed to get rid of anyway. It was at the end of its uh, uh, a life. So we're, you know, doing a one car family thing right now for a short period of time while she makes a decision what she's going to buy. And that's been going on for about three months. So this is a, a little bit longer than we needed to be looking for a new vehicle. But anyway, long story short, uh, my son now has uh, basketball and soccer practice on Monday 
and Thursdays. So, you know, I'm thinking, okay, what time does that start? And what time can I get back to the house? So, you know, for me, I still can record on Monday and Thursdays, but I'm pushing the live time, which really, you know, at 8 o'clock away standard time, not very many people are awake anyway. Um, but I have to push the live time anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes back. Uh, but, again, it's just life. It's one of those things you have to adjust with. And, I'm, you know, I was complaining, do I move the show to a different day? And I'm like, no, I just, after that many episodes, I can't, can't do it. So, Rob, you were mentioning that uh, you just got, uh, you started doing Podcast 411 again. So what, uh, or you're getting ready to put out an episode of Podcast 411. Yeah, I got an interview on Tuesday with Dan Carlin from uh, Hardcore History and Common Sense. So uh, it'll be good to get a, a new episode back out in the can. And then I, you know, I want to get back, try to at least do, try to do two a month, at least one a month going forward. I, I miss doing the show. Uh, so I'm going to try to get some fun guests on people I've been talking with over the years and that, that I always wanted to have on podcast one one. So there's a few people I was always like, Oh, you know, I really wish I had done an interview with Dan Carlin beforehand. I was like, well, you know what? I can still do that. Equipment's still here. So, uh, you know, my, the today in iOS podcast is really, that's what really consumed me. I, I put 20 hours a week into that show. So, uh, doing all the research and everything else. So that, that's kind of took up a lot of my free time. If, if you can call having free time, free time. Someone was staying, saying in the chat room, um, I would have to wait till my family goes to bed before I start my recording. She would string me up if I tried to sneak away. You know, I think that's another thing, too, that needs, you know, we should probably talk about because, you know, from the very beginning, you know, it was very obvious. I, you know, I told my wife, this is a business. It is a, uh, it's going to keep our lights on. It's going to feed the family. Um, you know, I do the raw voice stuff, uh, really nine to five. I don't focus on my personal show during the daytime. And then, you know, comes, uh, five o'clock, uh, we have some, you know, have something to eat, get the kids, whatever we need to do by six, I'm in podcast mode. So I think it also depends, uh, from, a you know, people that are creating content that aren't necessarily in it for the business portion that balance, you know, like this, you know, like this gentleman says in the chat room, you know, his wife would kill him if he did it before the kids went to bed. And I know some families or some wives are, you know, there is uh, you have to be a hundred percent engaged, uh, you know, Monday through Sunday, but uh, you know, to do this, there are certain, you know, to do it well. Um, even I getting started as late as I do, sometimes the show suffers because I'm just absolutely whacked. Um, so you know that that has a, you know, that has a has an impact. You know, how have you been able to juggle that, Rob? Uh, Rob caffeine mints. The <laughs> <laughs> caffeine. Where are they? There they are. Caffeine king, king dog caffeine mints. That, that's what helps me keep going. <laughs> Daddy's a little helper. Uh, uh, so, you know, so the question I have for you guys on that front is, so when are you guys going to pod fade? <laughs> I, you know, my, my, my uh, story has been from the beginning when I get sick and tired of doing the show, when it's no longer fun. I'm not, yeah. you know, it's not, it's, you know, obviously it's a big part of our, uh, um, you know, making the mortgage payment, but it's, uh, you know, I do have a, a military retirement. I can a little bit fall back on, but I live in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, you know the pot baiting is not going to happen anytime, uh, anytime soon. Well, it's cheap living there, right? You don't have to pay a heating bill. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'll trade you my electricity. Like I'll take your heating bill if you take my electricity bill. How about that? I uh, know. I'll pass on that. <laughs> yeah, I live. I live in as cheap areas you can probably live in. I live in Kansas City. So. Um, yeah, but it, are you? Uh, are you in the area where they put in the? Uh, the Google, Google Fiber. Fiber, not yet. The town oh. I'm in, Google Fiber has been announced to the west. It's already in the east, and it's already in the north. And they're expecting the town I live in to announce Google Fiber uh, in the next month or two, that they'll be bringing it in. So maybe a year from now I should have Google Fiber, oh, and then everyone, so... can, everyone can hate me. I'm so <laughs> jealous. I, I've been to, so, I've Rob, are you going to have a houses. Google Fiber so, so, podcast? <laughs> what? Sorry. Well, I, I know some people that have Google Fiber, and they've run six HD streams off of YouTube at the same time, no stuttering. 
They go, it's, they said everything you think it is and more, you know, it's really nice. I wonder how many people are hosting their podcast on their Google fiber connection. There's not too many podcasters uh, are, uh, here. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> and, and, and honestly, there's not that many people that have been connected to Google Fiber yet. It's still it's still phasing out. It only started up in October. I tell you, it's so. just uh, you know, I, I just I'm insanely jealous about those that are lucky enough to have it. Um, you know, my goodness, it's a uh, you know, it's just you know, you know, if you look at the rest of the world, we're we're, we're like getting smoked. Um, you know, Japan, uh, I look at, I went, when I went to Japan last time and, uh, um, my sister-in-law had a, a wireless connection. It wasn't even wired. It wasn't nothing wired to the house. It was some sort of a, you know, like a, and it wasn't mobile. It was some sort of a wireless internet that they have there. And I don't know how they might, you know, how they delivered it. Um, but I was getting like a hundred megs down and like 20 megs up. And I'm just like, and I'm like, how much are you paying? And she's, you know, she's does the math. It's like 35 bucks. And I'm just like, where is this country headed if we can't get higher bandwidth speeds? And Google Fiber, I think, is 120 a month, and it's 1,000 up, 1,000 down. You know, Time Warner says you don't need any more speed. You know, who are they? You know, it's because they don't want us to have more speed because they don't want to put the infrastructure in. Mm-hmm. Who do you guys have a, as a cable provider there now, Rob? Are you on Comcast or somebody? Yeah, I'm on. Huh? Yeah, I'm on. Yeah, I'm on Comcast. Yep. How about you, Rob? Uh, Rob I'm on Shorewest, so I'm getting 25 down and about seven up. And that's pretty good. Now, yeah, here I in, pay a little extra for that. I'm getting 50 down and three up, and it costs me 120 bucks a month. Oh, geez. When I said a little extra, I'm only like 60 or something like that a month. So, yeah, that, yeah. I think Sure West does a pretty good job, but yeah. again, it's not Google Fiber. Yeah. Yeah. I get what the server can deliver to me down and, and, and probably five to 10 up. Yeah. You know, and I, I think that's the thing, too, is that, you know, it, you know just like today, um, you guys are on a DSL connection. That's what that is. I've got yep. the stream going out over Time Warner Business Class, and then I have um, home internet for my kids to use, uh, you know, for whatever they're doing. So I got I got three connections <clears throat> here in the house I'm paying for, and uh, you know, largely because if I do this, I need the, the extra bandwidth. The you know I can't just bundle everything up on the Business Class; it won't handle it. All. Uh, you know, if I try to push a 1.5 meg upstream, it, it, it just about dies. So I usually have to throttle it back to 640K, which, you know, that's an SD experience. So, but Well, from what I understand, it, I mean, as far as this whole bandwidth question, and the, the, fiber in, the fiber capacity is actually there. It's not, I think that there's a little bit of a fallacy out there that the, uh, that there isn't the capacity and all, all this kind of stuff, and they're going to have to invest more. There's a lot of dark fiber that is in this country that hasn't even been lit up yet. Um, so I think that it's more about kind of um, keeping profit margins high and, and kind of ruling this out. It's kind of like what the, the Intel processing you know processors do or the AMD folks where they – they trickle out updates because that maintains their long-term profit margins. It's really the last mile has, has always been the issue with with it. Yeah, I mean, that's right. And, and, that's true and, too. And that's one of the reasons why Korea is so much better connected than the U.S. because the population is so much more dense. The U.S. is really spread out. Yeah. And, and that's an issue. I mean, even Google Fiber, if you look at what they're spending, doesn't make a lot of economic sense. I mean, <laughs> so, um, you know, what, what you're looking at, with Google Fiber is Google's making this investment because they're going to make money off of it in other ways, um, not from the service. And and hopefully they can roll it out in more cities. But right now, I think the only three places they have it um, announced is Kansas City, um, Austin, and what's it, Pro, um, Provo? Uh, no, uh, one place in Utah. Um, so I think those are the only three places right now where Google Fiber is announced. 
I, I just yeah. it just can't come fast enough. And for those of you who saw me that were on the video, go back and mute myself and uh, look like I yelled. Uh, I think my son forgot to take out the garbage can. <laughs> 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 and I hear the garbage truck, so I was like, mute, garbage can. <laughs> Todd, uh, we actually heard that. So oh, you did? I think you yelled yelled before you actually flipped the switch, so <laughs> it's all right. How did you guys hear that? Oh, it, I don't think it went out of the air, though. It went back, oh, it in, the, okay. it went back in the feedback loop. I'm sorry for yelling in your ears. <laughs> We were like, what's going on with Todd? Oh, I have to remember that. Oh, man, that sucks. I'm sorry. You guys are like, what the heck is he doing? Uh, that's uh, that's that's uh, production quality for you right there. See, for all the people that predicted there was going to be yelling between us, they weren't predicting it was going to be about garbage. <laughs> oh, there's never yelling between us, Rob. We have our fun. We have our fun doing our jib-jabs back and forth. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for, I mean, those that don't know, uh, Todd and I, we've known each other for years. Actually, Todd interviewed on the show over eight years ago. You were on Podcast 411. Yeah, I think uh, I was way your, back when. I think I was one of your, I think I was one of the early interviewees, I guess, probably. Y yes, you were. You were yes. back probably before I even figured out how to get all the audio and everything <laughs> sounding right. So back early, in the early days, so I think like the first 30 shows I took, I took down because I was so embarrassed of the audio quality because once I figured out how to record Skype right, I was like, ooh, that other stuff sounds pretty bad. I'm going to take that down. I, I, but, had to, I had to take episode one and two down because there was ACDC uh, playing in the beginning. Uh, uh, <laughs> <so>. <laughs> Uh, and actually, and actually episode one got completely lost. I completely lost episode one. Probably a good thing. It's, there's still a lot of people that think they can put music on their podcast. That's true. Um, yeah. One of the best ones I saw was a guy who sent me an email where he was basically screaming because he put everything in all caps, saying, um, don't tell me I don't have the rights to this music. I bought it. <laughs> <laughs> I have the CDs. <laughs> I'm like, that does not give you the right to make it a pod put your music no. in a podcast. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I hear yeah. that a lot, too. I hear a lot of shows that are playing music that they shouldn't be playing. But it's, you know, I mean, when, when was the last time that any of us heard about somebody getting sued for playing music in their podcast? So, I, you know. Well, I, I'm not I mean, I know it's happened. As much as I talk smack about the RAAA, the BPI, um, all those groups, there is just no way. Matter of fact, I'm like every two weeks, I'm telling my kids, you're not using BitTorrent. You're not uh, download. Where did you get that song? Um, you know, it's a, it's a big conversation because, you know, really, I have been brutal to those organizations over the years. And, you know, I'm like making sure my kids are, you know, not going to get me a 25,000 because, boy, they, they would love it. Oh, Todd's IP. Oh, and they would, you know, and I would be getting a letter in the mail. It's not. Yeah. We get takedown notices. You know, we get notices oh, at do? Libsyn for shows that have music in it, and we have to go and take those episodes down and, and let the producers know they can't do this. You know, and some oh, some okay. are repeat offenders, and we tell them you do it after a couple few times, and your account's gone. You know. Yeah. So, uh, so Rob, what's the what's the normal uh, situation with that? Are they playing full tracks, or are they they playing just it, snippets? Well, I mean, the way the DMCA is three seconds, two seconds of music is is just as bad as five minutes of a song. Yeah, you know, no, I agree. As far as the, the law, there's no such thing as fair use when it comes to music. Yeah. Um, in most of the cases, though, when we've gotten the DMCA takedown notice, it's been the full song. And, and, and yeah. you know, it, it, and we don't get a lot of them um, for the number of shows we have and the number of episodes that go up. But we do get them. Uh, it's what I handle. And, and you know, and... As Todd knows, there's certain ways you have to deal with it from the Safe Harbor Act on the DMCA, yep. and we have yep. certain things we have to do when we're notified, and we have, you know, and we we follow that, and we do exactly what we have to do by the law. And if we don't, I mean, then we will risk losing the entire service because right. you know there's no wiggle room in that. It's pretty brutal. And you know, and it's and it's you know, I even go to to an extent where I have a quote unquote trusted agent um, account even for my own personal property. Um, because I'm doing interviews now, if some interviewer gets pissed off and tries to take the content down, I want to have the full legal way that it would go through and they would request a takedown. So, you know, but at Raw Voice, obviously, you know, I don't deal with a lot of music takedown requests, 
the, what we get the most are people that are coming in months and sometimes years later and saying, I want this interview taken offline because, and, and it's usually maybe the person said something in that interview that they've had a change of heart or maybe it's hurting them. Actually, one guy begging us to take the content down because it was um, hurting his uh, job aspects because people would t- go- the employer would Google the guy's name. It would pop as like the number two thing in Google. They'd play the audio and hearing this guy saying some obtuse thing and he wouldn't get a job. Um, and basically we said, sorry, you're going to have to go back to the content creator. And, uh, you know, what do you do then if the content creator is done, if they have shut down? That content's out there. It's uh, it can be uh, it can be tricky. It really can. And I've never gotten any quote unquote uh, lawyer letters, but we've always gotten emails per se, uh, people asking for content to be taken down. How, you know, yeah, how you Todd, guys... I think you've you've touched on a really important issue that I I don't think has talked been talked about very much in this space is is um, I mean I can think I can speak to it just my own experience uh, working for a big company. And doing doing shows and being on a lot lot of different shows. I mean, I'm I'm always worried that, you know, I go on a show and I'll say something that will, will you know, be something that's bad for my employer or something like that. It's not like I'm I'm out there, you know, swearing and being a bad uh, representative of the company. But but it is something that you always think about. You know, I mean, it, I mean if you're working for a big organization, uh, typically what employees do is that they they tend to stay out of the media. They tend to stay out of um, uh, doing shows like this or putting themselves out there. And and this is an issue I think with you know hobbyist podcasters that um, want to put out a show. You know, maybe they have an expertise in a particular area and they work for a big company and they're out there expressing themselves and it's it's really easy to kind of slip into a, a mode where you're you're offering commentary or or talking about um, uh, issues relating to your employer and and um, there's been things that have come up on Twitter lately even you know from places like Microsoft and Xbox and where an employee jumps in out there and starts talking to the community and they're not really um, skilled at doing that, and they get themselves fired. So I don't know if you know. Have you guys seen things like this happen? You know, around podcasters. Well, like case in point, that you know, that guy that was begging us to take the content down, Rob. Okay. Yeah. Okay. He was. Yeah. Yeah. The first podcaster I ever remember getting fired um, was uh, uh, Nate and Die. Nate from uh, Nate and Die Show got fired because uh, he, he was doing a podcast. Uh, it wasn't even mentioned in his company that he worked for. It wasn't even for the company. He was just doing a podcast, and the, the owner of the company didn't like his political beliefs and views. So they, yeah. they, the owner of the company fired him. Wow. I mean, that goes back eight, over, it was about eight years ago when that happened, uh, Nate and Die Show. And, uh, you know, there's, there have been uh, probably other people that have lost their jobs because of their podcast or not gotten hired because of their podcast. Um, but, the, but I bet there's probably more people that have gotten a job or have been hired yeah. because of their podcast. So, you know, it's just, you know, if you yeah. put yourself out there, some people are going to like it and some people aren't. And if you say something stupid, <laughs> you know what? Sometimes you're going to get fired. Now, in Nate's case, he didn't say anything stupid. He just gave his political views and they were different than happened to be, um, than the person that owned the company. And he happened to live in a state where you could get fired for the, for combing your hair the wrong way. Um, so there was nothing he really could do about it. Yeah, and I've known guys that have done um, podcasts, but have have totally done them as an alias and totally totally made up a name for themselves and a whole kind of image and on, online presence um, that was completely fake. Um, and did a did a podcast with their their wife, and their wife came up with a whole fake person. Um, to protect their privacy and to protect their their employer that was uh, you know a big name big name employer that probably um, they were scared that it, it could compromise their career because they were they were being silly and they, they were making fun of people and it was a comedy kind of thing 
Um, but you know, I've known of people that, that that have done that, where they've just created almost like stage names, you know, for for themselves to protect their privacy. Yeah, I don't think Lewis. it's a good idea, I mean, but anyway. Yeah, I mean, Callie Lewis, you know, that's her stage name. Um, uh, and there's been others that have done that. When I started out, I never gave my last name. When I first started podcasting, I didn't have my image or anything out there. It was, was a long time before people knew who, what, who my last name was. I just went by Rob at Podcast 411. That was it. One of the um, things for that, privacy. One of the things that I had to deal with, and both of you know, I was still active duty when I started the show. Yeah. And... Without going into any detail, I was I worked in a job that uh, I had access to, I guess what we'd say is a lot of information. And uh, much of that information, I'm still bound, you know, today, even though I'm retired, I have signed my life away for the next 40 years or 50 years of not disclosing any of those topics or things that relate to them or can be attributed. So even today, um, there are news items that come up that I don't even, I, I want to talk about them, but because I have a resident knowledge of things that happened when I was in the Navy, I just don't do it. Um, and, and I probably would never have an issue. But if the wrong person said, well, he knows a little too much, you know, what does he know too much? And they pulled my record and said, holy shit, you know, this guy's got this, you know, and he signed that and let's go arrest him. So, you know, I'm, you know, I'm very, very cautious in even today, five years ever after having retired, that there are certain topics I just won't cover. And it's, it's a self-preservation of, uh, you know, maintaining the number when I was given trust to that information. So, you know, I have to honor that uh, that commitment. And I do it willingly, you know. But at the same point, there's probably people that work for companies who have signed NDAs. They can't talk yeah. about their work. They can't talk about, uh, you know, they're allowed to have uh, talking points per se. Um, so it, it could very much be a very slippery slope for folks. And I can understand why people could uh, would want to set up an alias. And even then, you're really not protected because, you know, for example. Um, I'm playing a, a, a game by Google now called Ingress. And when I put the, my name out there, my uh, AKA alias, um, and I really didn't go out and expose myself uh, uh, beyond my show. And my show doesn't have a big Hawaii audience. Um, and it, but still within two weeks, people figured out who I was. Um, they just put one plus one plus one together. And, of course, with a big online presence, it didn't take them long. So if you're at a company, believe me, you're, you are not safe if you're trying to hide behind an alias. They will figure. And if you have any online presence whatsoever, someone's going to put one plus one together. And you make an offhand comment, and that's all it takes. I mean, if you, you're working at Halliburton, probably best not to do a podcast about eco-friendly <laughs> sh environment stuff. Uh, probably not going to last long there. Uh, they're going to find out who you are. Uh, yeah, it, you just have to be smart about what you're doing, too. I mean, you don't want to be doing a show that's counterproductive to your day job. Right. Um, because when they find out, they're not going to be happy. Now, if you're doing something that is nothing related, um, you know, if you're sitting there on your your podcast and you're talking about getting stoned and, and, and going to work drunk or something like that, expect that to come back and haunt you at some point in the future. Yeah. I mean, you, you have to be intelligent about this. Um, the, the Don't be stupid at what you're talking about. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. The, the, fun, the most fun story that I have told over the years is that I had a, a podcaster that was doing really well. He was uh, making well into six digits on advertising every year. And, um, uh, he told me, do not ever, 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 ever give any indication um, who I am and how much my show makes. Don't ever, ever. Because if my boss finds out that I'm making six figures doing a podcast, I'm going to get fired. So he was worried that because his show was successful and that he was still holding, you know, he's doing a day job, you know, full time, 40 hours a week. And he's, he's making as much in his podcast as he's making in his day job. So he was really, really uh, anxious about 
the word getting out that his show was doing well. Um, you know, it was obvious to everyone the show was doing well, but no one really knew, quote unquote, the real dollar signs. And uh, yeah. for him, that was it was an, it was an interesting dilemma he had. So, Rob, yeah. anything else exciting you're seeing new going on in the space? Something that I know that there's some negative stuff going on in the space right now. I don't know if we even want to talk about that, but what? Uh, yeah, you talk about the idiots from Texas. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> you, yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, you said that I did Because if it. I let my real feelings come out, it'd be, yeah, it wouldn't be good. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, I know, I really probably can't. That's one of the things where I probably can't say anything. But uh, okay, that's, you, I'll you, just say that uh, not enough mean and nasty things could happen to them to make me feel sorry, ever. And so. at the device of my attorney, I will refrain from saying anything. <laughs> 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 I mean, well, I, I, think I wish the we whole could. thing of, me, the three of, of us of together saying, around, you know, at a bar sometime, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about yeah, it. Yeah, with no recorders on. <laughs> yep. No Google Glass, right? That's right. Yeah, hey, I think that's... it's one of those things that the, the guys um, saying that you're you're not going to say anything about it basically tells it all anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of glass, I'm scheduled to get glass. What, uh, what, what do you think? What do you think is glass going to make a... Is it going to be impactful? It's the segue of wearable computers. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> I'm thinking about from a, people con from a content. Look at it. I mean, I, it's not going to ever take off. Too many privacy issues, and it just, it, I, don't, I don't see it becoming socially acceptable norm. Uh, I think there's too many issues. I think, what's it, glasshold.com? There's a, there's a site out there already on that what they call people glass holes uh i, I don't know I, i'm anti i don't i just think it's a bad idea overall well you know i think the situation is is people that are wearing are gonna have to be smart um you know you're not gonna want to wear glass in a bar where people are drinking and you know not a friendly crowd if you're at a conference or something you might get away with it but if you are in a bar and you're recording or you have glass on, you know, some guy's in there with his uh, mistress or you name it. There's all kinds of, of concerns. I think out in the public, it'll be okay in certain aspects, but I'm sure Google is giving out some, some guidance. I would hope that they are in etiquette of using glass. But, you know, if you look at what people are doing with their cell phones today, people are taking pictures, they're doing video. It's not much different except that it's always available at just the touch of a, you know, just touch the side in your recording. And where the difference is you have to get your phone out. So I think people are more accepting of it, but it is going to be an interesting, I, you know, I can't wait to go. The first thing I want to do is go to TSA with them on and leave them recording as I stick them into the tray to let them go through x-ray. That's, that's. <laughs> <laughs> You want to see what goes on? Well, we know what goes on. Machine, it goes in. Right? It just yeah. goes through the, the the glasses go bzzz, and the and the video quits. That's probably what's going to happen. Um. <laughs> Where I think they're actually going to be popular and actually be successful is more along assembly lines where you give them to workers and they can use it in their day job. In their job, they can look and see how something is supposed to be assembled. And especially for environments where you have a lot of different assembly processes or products that you're going through the line, not the same thing over and over. I think from an industrial point of view, Google Glass may catch on. I just think from everyday mom, pa use, I think there's already bars that have already banned them. And you're going to see a lot of places that are going to have, you know, that, that aren't going to allow them in. And I just, I, I just think there's too many issues on the privacy side for it to be successful. Well, yeah, the same thing happened with the Segway too. It 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 became very much a product that that we used for very specific purposes and and was in the industrial area, like in, in like big warehouses and and things like that. And it it never became a mainstream product. Though I do have to say that I think that we need to back up and and look at it a little bit more more objectively I think from the big picture of this whole wearable computing trend and what what this Google Glass represents as part of that trend is that I think wearable computing lightweight um, uh, flat screen I mean very thin screen kind of kind of experiences are 
are going to be part of the computing space in the future. What that actually looks like, I, I think, is a big question mark. And I also think as the technology gets more miniaturized, it becomes more embedded in the, the glasses that you wear. Um, though I do ag agree, Rob, I think in general concept, I think the analogy that I'm a little bit seeing uh, that would be is just kind of the whole geek factor. Unless that miniaturization can get to a point where it's not really visible on your face, and that there's going to need to be kind of um, government regulations or some sort of regulation about about how these and how and when these experiences are are used um, before they're ever going to um, get wide adoption. <clears throat> and I there's just I mean I, I agree with you. There's so many issues that need to be addressed here. And I one thing that I'm curious about though is that I think one of the big um, things that's coming from it already, even from the people that are that are just you know getting them now, is the the media that's being created from these things. And to kind of take it back, this is the the new media show. How, how do you guys think maybe you know a certain segment of the you know geek audience, the the Robert Scobles you know of the world, but he is very <laughs> very unique, obviously. But well, the porn what kind industry, of, if you want to talk media, kind kind of new media could we see come out of this? Whole thing, I, I, I think. Um, I think the porn industry, this will be fine for. Uh, I mean, yeah. they're they're going to adopt it. I mean, but yeah, I don't know. POV uh, cam. Yeah, what would you say, Todd? Point of view cam. That's point of view cam. POV. Yeah. Okay. But you know, yeah, I, you know, I think Roberts hurt Google Glass more than he's helped it. <laughs> Uh, you know, <laughs> to a he meme. doesn't think so. No one yeah. wants to see Robert Scoble in the shower. Um, <laughs> you know, n no one wants to see Todd Cochran in the shower. But you know, I think from a use standpoint, this is not going to be Justine TV. This is not. Some people are going to try to do that. But at the same point, I think that's been done, done and done. But I think you know, maybe from a perspective of uh, reality TV. Um, that could be pretty incredible and a lot of editing, but it could be pretty incredible if you had a whole family wearing uh, Google Glass. And as long as they get the yeah. audio right, that, that could uh, make for some interesting content. Um, you know, even uh, we thought about, you know, I thought about what would happen if I had four people on Google Glass in a vehicle we, or we went sightseeing and um, how that would be mixed up and, I think from the public standpoint, though, I don't want the government involved. I think it's going to self-regulate. People are going to figure out where it's possible. I don't want the government involved at all, and it's already too much involved in our lives. They stay the heck out and let technology continue to move yeah, forward. Yeah, but you know that just, they're going to. Yeah. And they're going to want to tap into the video and the pictures that are, that oh, are taken with those things. Right. You know, I they're mean, they're already that, doing that. that. I mean, it's just another camera that they can tap right. in to do surveillance, right? And, uh, yeah, that that's concerning. But, uh, you know, it's you can always turn the camera off. At least you think it's off. I, I don't know. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll see uh, where it uh, where that leads. But, yeah. you know, there's all kinds of cool content things. But, you know, at the same point, your head is not necessarily the best camera either. And you're yeah, going to... There's going to be some stabilization that's going to be built into this thing, too. And people are going to get used to shooting video with it, um, you know, in that, in that mode as well. They're going, to, they're, going to, they're going to develop techniques to keep their head still, and they'll become more aware of it. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see where it goes. From the <laughs> so, Rob, you don't want to buy a set, huh? You don't want them? No, I'll, I'll, I'll just get a watch. I'll get a smartphone watch, you know, iWatch or whatever. I, I, I tried to actually get the Pebble, and they, they closed down the orders on the Pebble for me before I was able to buy it. Um, but, yeah, to me, if I wore those around my wife and she knew I was looking, oh. at checking emails or doing any of that, the glasses probably wouldn't last more than two or three weeks before they were broken anyway. So it'd be 1400 bucks down the drain. Yeah, and I'm sure... And once I get mine, it's going to be a situation where kids are running around after showers and stuff. And if I'm wearing Google Glass, uh, that, that's a little weirdo. That's a little creepy. So, there's, you know, again, there's a, going to be a time and a place even in the household for these things as well. well the but other you know, I heard about kids Google are going to really like this thing. Though. You're going to have to deal with and me is glasses. 
my understanding is, you know, if you've got glasses, yeah, uh, Google Glass doesn't work too well because they're not prescription at this point. Right. No, but they're going to be. That's already been said by the team that they they are working of a on a on a version of it that that, that will be available for prescription glasses. For me, it's so, the near it's vision come. stuff, not it's the come. far vision stuff that's going to impact me. And we, the way they've got it set up is I think the screen size is, it appears to your eyeballs, like a 26-inch screen at 24 inches. I'll be fine from that perspective. Uh, you know, it's it's going to be it'll be an interesting test to see how it is. And if, it, if I can't see the screen, I'm sure my son will have a great time with it. Well, I'm talking about when not just so much a screen, but really just – Oh. When you're driving or where anything yeah. else, if you're not wearing your glasses, now you have to wear these over your glasses, and that won't work. Yeah, so yeah, they, they, the lenses themselves have to be prescription at some point, and that's it, yep. it's good to hear that they're going to do that. Um, but you yep. know, for for me, I, I I have no interest because right now I couldn't wear them. Yeah, I guess it depends on your prescription level too. But it almost seems like that the the generation that's that is more likely to support this is going to be the 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 younger generation it it seems like but i also you know i don't i don't know though i mean it's it just seems like that those there, there's a lot of younger people that, that that are that really embrace kind of this this new geeky stuff and it's a way to put themselves out there and it's a way to to stand out and to be be perceived as as cool but it could also go the other way right we just don't know yet where it's, it's perceived kind of, uh, as geeky and 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 uncool and stuff like that. So I, you know, my, I, I just don't know which way it's going to go. My kids are absolutely going eight crazy with the GoPros. Um, you know, I bought one for me and one for my son, and there's none here now. I my they're both with both of them. They're using them for all kinds of stuff and. My my daughter belongs to JROTC, and you know they got they took and melted one to a you know, to some sort of a cap that they were using and they did it in, they were doing uh, um, a, a competition where they were doing rope climbing and stuff like that. So they were, you know, they had this on while they were doing all that and they made a little wrap up video. My son's using it surfing and boogie boarding and, you know, and putting little video clips to his buddies and, you know, they're just absolutely going crazy with these things. So I know that the second that these things, you know, are in my hot hands, the next thing is going to be is like, I want to use those. I'm sure. And I think you're right, Rob. I think the young generation is going to go crazy over this thing. Yeah. We'll see, though. But it, you're, you guys are exactly right. It's going to raise a lot of issues. <laughs> so, Rob, where do you think, uh, Rob uh, Walsh, where do you think space is headed over the next year? Podcasting space, new media space. You know, my opinion is where we've been heading is, is it's more going mobile. I mean, the only thing I love about the mobile and what I mean, we've focused on it is it's made it easy to consume podcasts. Right. You right. don't have to sit anymore. It's easy to listen to podcasts as it is to play Angry Birds. You open up your smartphone, tap on an app, you tap play, you're done. You, you listen. It really has become easy. I mean, when we all started doing this, you had to get a special program, iPod or app, because before even iTunes. And you had to download and you had to sync it. And if you commuted every day, I remember to sync every morning before you left. You know, there was a lot of, you know, barriers to entry for people that weren't willing to put the extra work in. Now, people find a show they like. They get the app for that show. They tap, they listen. If they want to send feedback, there's an email button. There's a call, the show button. So I think really where I see it going is I see mobile moving up into 65% range uh, downloads for the shows that we have. I just see more more mobile consumption and i think that's a good thing for the industry i think it's really helped it i think the comedy side of podcasts has really helped it you know podcasting get getting a big name you know mark Aaron with his tv show joe rogan's gonna have a tv show again here on sci-fi and it starts in july so you know you get more more podcasters um that have mainstream appeal bringing more and more people back into podcasting to listen so i i, I see good things i just uh, I've never been one of those ones that said podcasting has been down. We've always seen continued growth. Um, but in the last year, we've seen more growth than we've seen in the past. Uh, and I think a lot of it has to do with mobile and comedy. You know, I, our Skype connection is getting a little flaky. But, you know, I think um, when iTunes, everyone was uh, poo-pooing the iTunes app. And there was a few little snafus with that initially. 
But when they actually put the, made its own app, the numbers went up dramatically. People were, you could see that that utilization was uh, really, they, I mean, they, they really made a big impact um, in that. And I just hope the rest of the mobile providers are, you know, continue to, you know, make improvements in their, their mobile experience. And, you know, there's no doubt that uh, the barriers to consumption are, really, there's no barriers to consumption. It's just content. And I think, uh, you know, the traditional quote unquote, oh, you got to sync it to your phone. That's long gone. And uh, anyone that's still sticking to that, it needs to do a reevaluation of really how things are working in the space today. But I will say there is a time and a place for that technology still to be used. And a lot of rural people do not have, you know, the, the best connectivity still. So sometimes those folks are still afforded the ability to be able to, you know, download and listen later if they need to. So it's there and they can, uh, you know, there's an app for that or there's a mobile device for that. So it's, it's, it's good. I think you're right. But the mobile space is definitely, uh, definitely hot. I'm, I think where we both differ is personally, I think it's a waste of money for a podcaster to have an individual app unless they have a really, really large audience uh, for the average guy i think they say find me on itunes or find me on uh, this app or find me on stitcher is much more effective and easier for the listening audience than having an app for every program because i i don't use it i you know i have uh, a dozen podcasters apps on there on my device and i have used them once or twice and the rest of the time i'm i just subscribe via the the podcast app on itunes and it's just easier. It's a single place to get everything. Well, I, here's where I see the difference on that is if you have your own app in the iTunes app store, you have your own app in the Amazon app store and the Google Play app store, and someone's in there searching for a category on running, and they're looking for a running app, and they happen to come across your podcast, they may never have thought about listening to a podcast. But here is an app for the show that, hey, I'm interested in running. Here's a running app. It's free. Let me go listen to it. And they'll download the app. They don't know anything about podcasting. They never have thought to listen to a podcast their entire life. But now they found you because you were in the app store. So it gives you a point of discovery that you, you couldn't get elsewhere. I, I, I highly suspect people are actually trying to find podcasts in the iTunes store. If they're not finding you on the web, they're not going to find you. Discovery does not happen in iTunes. You know, you can search for a show almost exactly by their name, and you still won't find them uh, in the app store. I'm not a big proponent of discovery from the app store it's sure it may get a few few people in the door but i just can't imagine that being very high yeah and well, that, that, again I, that's I, my I opinion agree on that you know again from our experience we've been on the mobile side and had the apps out there for a long time and i can tell you one show had more downloads of their app purchases of their app this is when their app was for sale than they had listeners to the podcast because they did an app on the show they did a podcast on webkins people were going in looking for a webkins app and they were buying this show and, and buying the app for the Webkins podcast because they discovered it searching for Webkins, not because they were looking for the podcast, because his download numbers for the app were much higher than what his podcast downloads were before he launched the app. Rob, uh, any thoughts on that? You're the yeah, impartial the, guy the, here. <laughs> the whole kind of um, um, discovery piece, I think, is, is, is very contextual, I think, is where it's moving to. And when I say, say contextual, it's is people are searching for something that they have an interest in or a brand or a TV show or a music artist or, and they oftentimes will stumble across a podcast about that, right? As they're searching, whether it's online, whether it's in iTunes or in the app store, if you think about, you know, going in and typing in a, like golfing or something like that in iTunes, there'll be a, um, shows in there, podcasts in there. There'll be maybe some music in there that is a you know is music related to golfing or something like that. So I think people <clears throat> are keyword driven, just like kind of search. But also it's it's friend recommendations and stuff like that. And people will go in and type in into iTunes <clears throat> the Geek News Central show because they heard from a friend that they've got a great show talking about new media, right? So. So I think that discovery is happening from a lot of different ways, and and I do think that the individual apps for podcasts has a place for deeper engagement with audiences. Um, but but I still believe that 
that the discovery part of finding new content happens in, in the search paradigm and on on the the web. And then, as a, an audience member becomes familiar with your show, maybe at that point they'll, they'll come in and, and look for your app. So maybe um, or apps that have multiple shows in it are are where the where where the sweet spot is. Um, but anyway, that's that's kind of kind of in a nutshell what I think is happening. You know, you guys are probably definitely more connected to that than I am. I think there's just two uh, two trains of thought, and I and I you know I look at where to put resources that are going to um, add to our bottom line, and uh, you know, and, and and where the resources are best spent, and where we can and where we at least feel we're helping podcasters the most, and um, you know, Rob's focused on the you know they're focused on the app side, which is you know just cool. It's a it's there's 25 different ways to slice this thing up, um, and I'm not saying apps are bad. I'm just thinking from a I look at it from a monetary standpoint on the money it costs to you know maintain an app you know and have all that in the in the store and keep it current and keep the versions up to date and everything else. I know what it costs us to maintain you know just um, single channels across the OTT space, and that's not insignificant. From a from a developer support standpoint, but uh, time will tell how this thing all shakes out. I think there's there's opportunities there for everyone, depending on which way they want to go. And I think it's good. I think there's good that there's options. Plus, also, I wanted to mention too that there's definitely a <clears throat> kind of a broader movement towards some new aggregator type platforms forming too um, that are not yet announced yet right. that are, are are coming on the scene that I don't you know there's just it feels like that there's kind of a, a a race to the space right now I don't know if you guys agree with that there's definitely change in the wind yeah uh, yeah there's definitely some new people that have come in to, because of the recent success of podcasting um, or are coming in um, because, you know, again, look in the press, and you'll see a lot of articles recently about podcasting. It's been back in the news again. Um, yeah. So while we're – before we let Rob and Kirby wrap up here, I definitely want to give Rob a chance to tell folks about Libsyn and what you guys do over there. Why don't you give everyone the, the two-minute money pitch? <laughs> what we do is we try to make it easy for people to podcast, uh, give you the tools to get your show up, a place to host, uh, and we mentioned the smartphone apps. Uh, we also uh, will help you with getting advertising, and then premium is another thing that we've been working on a lot. So we have uh, premium offerings where people are really starting to make some good money on the premium side, which is integrated back into the smartphone apps, kind of a, a Netflix model that we've done there. Uh, we have a Facebook app, so... You, presence on get help you get your presence on facebook uh and we've got an html5 player just all the tools to help you promote your show out there and host it and get really good stats and i uh, it's it's just where i've been hosting my podcast for the last eight plus years i love libsyn uh we've got a lot of you know 80 percent plus of the top podcasts and itunes on the comedy side are hosting with libsyn and a lot of the big shows out there you guys know the names of already are with us and uh, we'd just love to have you come over and check us out if you're looking for a place to host. Very cool. Libsyn was the, actually the first company in the space. I will say this. Uh, Libsyn came in at a good time when uh, when podcasters were desperate for bandwidth. Um, there was no options at the time, and the model that they uh, put in place was uh, was very unique. Um, you know, and basically an all-you-can-eat model, uh, essentially for a flat rate, and that uh, even today is, uh, you know, it's it's something that uh, is an interesting model even now. Um, let's go ahead, Rob. Do you get any last questions for Rob Greenlee? Any last questions for Rob? So are you guys um, um, both planning on going to the New Media Expo coming up uh, next next year, or is it too early to even talk about that? What is the date? Do we know what the date is for the show? Well, it's, it's part of CES again. It's in that same yeah, time frame. It's that same time frame. Yeah, for me, that's, you know, it makes it, it's a hard sell for me. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, that's my, that's my two weeks where we, you know, we set the tone for the whole year for my personal show, yeah. but uh, it, I'm sure we'll be there. Um, I don't know. It's, I was, to be honest with you, it's, it's growing, but the foot traffic in for the vendors is, man, 
and, and it really something needs I don't know there just wasn't a lot of foot traffic in the uh, in the uh, convention space do you think that the 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 industry should be thinking more about trying trying to align itself with the National Association of Broadcasters or do you think that the the industry needs its own event again the I'll be honest with you the uh, podcasters um, are not ready for NAB uh, I think the NAB is ready for the podcasters, but from a financial standpoint, the podcast. And you know, you go to if you're a podcaster and you go to NAB, you'll leave discouraged because it's NAB is a model of a market that is a multi-billion-dollar market, and they have products and services that um, starts in the five-digit space. There's very few things you can find at NAB that the besides gear that an average yeah. content creator um, can afford uh, from a production standpoint. And it's amazing. You, you, you really want to ground truth. It's amazing what we are able to accomplish at the prices we're able to accomplish. And it's amazing what they pay. Uh, maybe, mm-hmm. maybe they should come to our show. Uh, <laughs> well, go the other way. Huh? <laughs> I, I would say, though, for NM, uh, New Media Expo, having it around NAB would be good for New Media Expo because you would get more people that came from NAB over to New Media Expo than you would get from CES over to New Media right. Expo. I think New Media Expo is a more attractive second place to go ahead and check out while you're in town. Yeah. Whereas with, it, with, uh, with NAB than it was with CES. I think CES, yeah. you had people going from New Media Expo to CES, but you didn't have people from CES coming to New Media Expo. Right. I think if yeah. you went around NAB, it'd be the opposite way. You wouldn't have people from, as Todd said, going from New Media Expo to NAB, but you'd have people from NAB coming over to New Media Expo because, hey, the boss said, why don't you go check out this podcast thing while you're there? So from my perspective, selfishly, as, as Libsyn, or from Libsyn's perspective, I would rather see it around NAB because I think that would help us bring in clients right um personally i kind of liked it around ces because then i went over to ces and sort of stuff but yeah from lipson's point of view i think nab would be where i'd rather see it you know the you know and, and it's what's interesting about um podcasters are largely always looking for a deal and <laughs> most of them you know their budgets are limited so, you know, they are having uh, to make, uh, you know, some very serious decisions on do I buy, a, you know, what's your microphone do I buy? It's, you know, $50 price difference. Um, so, you know, for many of those folks, it's, it's really truly a financial situation, uh, you know, whereas, you know, when, when I'm at NAB, I know that, uh, you know, what the price range is going to be of stuff that I'm, you know, I'm looking to buy. You know, I found one solution. I mean, it was fantastic. It was this uh, ability to put up a, a Twitter stream, you know, basically like I brought up the, oops, I brought up the Libsyn uh, web page. It was the ability to bring up a, a Twitter stream that was really set up nice and it would allow to have a, a great uh, a video aspect. And it was perfect. And it was done by a guy that used to work at, um, uh, I think, Engadget. And he was part of their podcast folks. And he, and basically he said to me, he says, uh, the reason I'm at NAB is I have my business has to survive. And I asked him the price and I about fell over um, because it was uh, hundreds of dollars per month to use instead of let me buy this one time and be done with it. Everything there is done on a subscription model. There's nothing done on a, you, you know, basically you pay for it once and you're done. So... Yeah, it's a, it's a it's really a different space. It's a very eye opening. Yeah, well, Rob, I think I, I agree with your comment about um, the the New Media Expo better being aligned with um, the National Association of Broadcasters event. Uh, I think that, that there's a lot more synergy there, or even even the streaming media show is another one. Um, that but that's a pretty small show though that's the thing i mean you want to have want to have an association w- with a much bigger show but i i agree uh, that actually may not be a bad thing to uh mention to to Rick. the folks at the new media expo is to it, is to consider that i actually did tell them that uh when we were uh back in january when i was there i told um, um the guys that run it i said uh you know why don't you do this around NAB? And they go, oh, well, we're already kind of committed for next year. So maybe in 2015, um, 
they'll, okay. they'll do it. But and yeah, well, I, that's good. But I've been to NAB and I've been to CES now, and, and like Todd said, the prices are just. As a podcaster, you walk <sighs> over there. Keep your credit card at home. Don't bring it with you because you'll love what you see, and, and and you might be stupid enough to actually buy something. You know, and from a gear perspective, the gear is it's a great place to learn about gear. You know, this is there's no better show than that. But um, when it comes to, you know, I'm you know I went there with this whole vision of trying to find certain tools, and I found them. You know, and it's thirty five thousand this, twenty thousand that, five thousand that. I'm like, strip all this other stuff up. I want just that piece. You make that three thousand, I can sell that. But you, when it's at thirty five grand, it's not even in the even the remote market. You know, and yeah. uh, even at three thousand, there's a select group of content creators that can afford it too. So, um, yeah, it's it's really. You don't want to look at anything on the video side. Yeah, oh, your it's, video. Yeah. yeah, it's insane. Yeah. Just insane. It's getting cheaper though. It is getting much cheaper, and um, I still attest. It, some people like to watch. Some people like to listen. And if you have enough compelling content, you should make it so they can watch. And it makes you a better content creator because you're forced to not make mistakes. So I did see that uh, there was a, a a panel or two at South by Southwest on podcasting again, which um, had vanished from South by Southwest for a few years where they didn't have any panels. I know I put on a panel there once around podcasting. I think it was back in 2007, I think. Um, but wow. they, they they had one. It was a it was a pretty good panel. It had some comedians on it and some lo longtime podcasters. So that's another event that, that may be a good good place. One thing I found about South by and Rob, I don't know if you've been to South by or not. Uh, oh, pl plenty of times. Uh, yeah. uh, Rob Walsh, have you been to South? Oh by? yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I have actually not been to South by. I can't justify oh, yeah. the expense yeah. uh, expense report. Yeah. The uh, the thing about South by and the, what I recommend to South by is if you are a company, <laughs> you send your young team members. You know, you send. <laughs> I you know I I should should not go to South by. South by is a thirty five and under maybe. You know, that's kind of the high end, and you got some old guys there like me. But generally, 35 and under is, is the crowd. So if you have a, you know, someone in your company that is younger, send that younger person on a mission and, and things to do. It's, uh, it's definitely, in, in it, you know, the parties are as much important there as anything else. But, you know, I don't like socializing when there's a rock band playing in my ear. So, um, yeah, so you send your younger folks to South by. Let's, uh, well, also, there's a lot of um, lot of after hours events too right. that go on there too that are put on by brands that aren't necessarily parties. So, but they're anyway. usually loud, you know. And you, you get it some amount of, yeah. you, know, you get some amount of business done. But uh, uh, South by is definitely for uh, the young. You know, I was I, I went twice and I said uh, I'm not getting any business out of this. I'm not going to go. Yeah. Um, and I couldn't. And I, you know, I, you know, I, when I was 20, I could party to three o'clock in the morning and then wake up at six and be ready to rock and roll and, and move all day. It's, uh, you know, if I yeah. party to three o'clock in the morning, you're not going to see me till the next day. <laughs> 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 Especially if there's alcohol involved, it ain't happening. You know, it's just, you know, the body isn't as quick to metabolize as it used to be. So, yeah. All right, Rob, I'm, I hope you had a good time. We didn't beat you oh. up. Uh, had a good conversation. <laughs> I appreciate you guys having me on uh, and always look forward to talking to you guys. It definitely shows will. especially. Yeah. I'll we'll definitely have you on uh, later in the year as, as things develop and uh, as things move forward. And, you know, we're what, really what we're trying to do here is just keep a heartbeat of what's going on in the space. And Rob, you know, Rob, you know, my co-host here, Rob, you've been doing a great job getting guests in. Who do we have on the uh, ticker for uh, for next week and i also got some updates schedule updates for me i should share with you as well go ahead okay uh we have tim street who's the vp of mdialogue.com yeah. he's a long time he was a very early podcaster as well with uh um some some fun podcasts that he was involved in um back in the early days so it should be a good conversation he can give some perspective to us around um the whole set top box space too um, french just, maids tv yeah french made tv that's right just so you know rob 18th and 25th we should be good for me on saturday or sunday and on june oh. 1st 
Okay. Um, there could be an impact on June 1st, that Saturday. So we may have to move whatever's scheduled June 1st to Sunday the 2nd. Yeah, I had Dan Rayburn, who's the VP of StreamingMedia.com, set for the 1st. Uh, but See if you yeah. it may. Uh, I'll let you know for sure here in, in a few days if we're going to have to move that show. I may be airborne that Saturday the 1st. Okay. Because I had a change of plans. Originally, I was supposed to be gone the week of the 20th, and that slipped. So okay. I'm home okay. the week of the 20th. But, uh, every, hey, oh, we did have some folks that responded last week to our, our giveaway. Uh, we gave away all 10 copies of, of the book, um, uh, of Paul Colligan's digital book. So uh, congratulations to, uh, to those folks. If you've got uh, comments uh, that you want to send in about today's show, you can email Todd or Rob at newmediashow.com. And uh, let us know uh, what you think of the show. Give us suggestions on uh, future guests and uh, any topics that you want us to cover. Uh, that's always uh, welcome. But, again, congratulations to those uh, 10 folks. Actually, it was 10 people exactly that emailed for Paul's book. So no one was actually left out, which was, uh, which was perfect. So the, that's, you know, it was only cost me a buck each. So it was like a big expense, right? <laughs> So, Rob, any comments? Yeah, if you want to give um, some comments to us about the the topics that we covered on the the, the, the show here, and um, any suggestions on how we can improve, please let us know. If you want to send me an email to uh, Rob at newmediashow dot com, and I can also be followed on Twitter, and that's at Rob Greenley. And uh, Rob Walsh, where can they find you online? Oh. You can email me, rob at libson.com or rob at podcast411.com, either way. Uh, find me on Twitter at podcast411, and you can check out my podcast either at podcast411.com or at todayinios.com. And that's a pretty good show, too. I've watched a few of your episodes there. You've done a nice job with that. Oh, Todd, I also want, want to mention, too, um, yeah, if you're a podcaster and you're not in the, the Zoom or Windows phone catalog, f feel free to send me an email to podcasts at Microsoft.com, and I'll get you in the catalog. And uh, I think that's going to wrap us up, guys. Thanks for being here. A um, few of the live audience people have dropped off. I think that, that's a sign that we've went long enough. So <laughs> uh, everyone, thanks for being here. And those of you, obviously, there is both an audio and video portion of this that you can subscribe to. So it's a long show, so definitely get subscribed to the audio version. And, and again, you'll find that link at, at newmediashow.com. Everyone take care. We'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Aloha. everybody. Aloha.